Um, this talk is going to be a little bit about the Human Brain Project, a little bit about HPC, a little bit about Seth, and a little bit about how they all fit together. So it's about the mix of cloud technologies, high force computing technologies, and new forms of application, the way that they can actually fit together the pieces of the puzzle, and, uh, and whether it's really a good idea or not. Actually, this, um, uh, these images are from uh, Cambridge University, so this is actually one of the security admins at Cambridge University. They, uh, they got a new brain scanning machine and project around it, and I believe those, that's the inside of its head. The, uh, the bits of damage due to thinking about OpenStack too much are in yellow, so uh, I don't see that serious there. So, um, for me, I first started working in high performance computing in 1992 uh, when I was working on um, uh, parallel Solaris machines with uh, remote DMA. And um, I've, I've really been quite privileged and fortunate to work in a string of prominent high performance computing companies since then. Um, most recently, I was working at Cray at the European Research Labs in Bristol. And two years ago, I formed a, uh, a consultancy business based around this belief around high performance computing, OpenStack, and how the two actually, even though it doesn't look like it, are really made for each other. So we bet the company on that. At the point when I founded the company, uh, I took this photo. This is a, uh, a mountain in Wales where the uh, there are two pillars at the top of it. They're about six feet high, or two meters high. It's called Adam and Eve. And I took the photo as a metaphor for jumping into starting up a company. Uh, my business partner said it's, uh, it's complete rubbish. The, uh, the landing point looks far too solid for, uh, for it to be true. So um, I wish you'll see about that. Anyway, so the, the driving factor, the main project that we're talking about here is the Human Brain Project, which is this major flagship um, EU project aimed to provide researchers worldwide with um, the tools and the mathematical models for sharing and analyzing large brain uh, data that they need to understand how the human brain really works uh, in various approaches at various levels and actually for emulating the way that the human brain works as well. This is a big ticket HPC project, uh, several, several components to it. And the piece that we have been involved in uh, we are not directly involved in the Human Brain Project. We've been participating as a subcontractor to Cray, and um, in particular in this uh, pre-commercial procurement project. So this is a, um, a pilot system. Uh, it's a technology demonstrator based around exploring how new emerging technologies in high-performance computing infrastructure can be used uh, to address different, more challenging applications, like the way that they're hoping to model brain data and simulate. So we started our work on this project uh, last summer, and our work has really been around this system based at um, uh, ULIC Supercomputer Center in Germany. So it's a, a Cray CS400, and it's, uh, it's slightly special. It's got um, uh, 60 nice landing nodes in it. Uh, but it also has a um, omnipath fabric, so 100 gig fabric, and it has um, a number of novel storage technologies in it. But the main ones that I am going to talk about today are these um, non-volatile memory devices, the Fulton Tail SSDs. Uh, this machine's about uh, it's about two years old now, so it's based on Broadwell generation hardware. It's not Skynet, and. Um, but the, uh, so the, the hardware is, is getting on a bit, but the software and the technologies <coughs> that it is running and supporting are continuing to innovate even to this day. The Cray team uh, have been working on, um, on application level data movement. So they've been looking at how different stages within a simulation, uh, visualization components or different phases of the calculation, how the data can be staged and migrated between those different stages and transformed as it moves along the process as well. Uh, they have three application use cases for this, and they are promoting an um, open source project based on it called the Universal Data Junction. Um, I can't talk more about that though right now. So the NVMe devices in this system are primarily to enable an evaluation of Ceph. Now, Ceph is um, 
is this new storage cluster technology. And if you haven't heard <coughs> of Ceph before, maybe you've, you've uh, never come across cloud infrastructure or, or you've been living under a rock or you've been super focused on some very specialist niche area that uh, I probably wouldn't know much about either. But the idea behind Ceph is that it has become this ubiquitous storage platform uh, that underpins most cloud infrastructure, certainly in the open source world. And the interesting or the driving question that the Human Brain Project was posing is they, need, they want to innovate around this sort of storage scaling issue which is known as the POSIX problem. And Ceph is, it provides opportunities, it's, it's structured a little bit differently, it's wired up in slightly odd ways compared to conventional high performance computing parallel file systems. And the, the, the key detail is that it's underpinned by an object storage cluster. This has some appealing properties for scale, and Ceph does always demonstrate very strong scaling capabilities. Um, and that's one of the things, and one of the things that you could do on it is overlay a POSIX file system on top to create a parallel file system as well. So that parallel file system is, it sounds, you know, it's the second, the second role of, of Ceph, so it's, it sounds like it's not going to be good, but actually it's not nearly as, um, as secondary as you might think. So CFFS is a technology that is emerging and developing very quickly. Over the last three releases, it has gone from being um, sort of alpha release at best to something which you can really um, trust and rely on and, and will perform as well. It's got a very, very fast pace of development. And one of the main reasons that's driving that is that the, the way that Ceph is very closely coupled with cloud infrastructure like OpenStack and, and OpenNetNew as well. This machine is not running OpenStack. It could do, but it isn't. Um, but the, 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 the way that they play together is uh, it's probably worth a little explore anyway. So Ceph is software-defined storage, and OpenStack is software-defined everything. OpenStack is actually Ceph's pillar app, and um, but it, but the, the interesting piece for me is how does that fit with the way that scientific computing works today? So the analogy that I have is that OpenStack is like the second car in a garage. So you have this primary facility geared up for batch computing, sort of a linear calculation, lots and lots of um, uh, slow parallel file systems and so on. And then you have another facility for containing everything else, so the long tail activities, the, the web applications, the interactive applications, the weird stuff that builds on Maven and you can't really make it fit into the, uh, the module tools and the other things that you get in the slow environment. All of that stuff can be excellently served by an OpenStack cluster in support and in ta tandem with an HPC system as well. The question is, about Ceph as being like a major component of software-defined infrastructure is, does it actually stack up compared to the conventional HPC choices you might make of using Lustre or EGFS or something like that? So, I expect most of you have heard of Ceph, um, but you probably, if you have an opinion on how slow it is, it might be out of date, because this graph shows over the last three years, the performance of Ceph in IOPS in published benchmarks. So we're going from about 500 IOPS three years ago up to 100,000 IOPS per server. And this one is out of date as well. So this is um, data published by Intel, and that was done in the second half of last year. The, uh, it's based on the Luminous Ceph uh, release. We've now had the um, uh, Mimic Ceph, Ceph come out as well. The performance of Ceph is rocketing, it's surging upwards. It's coming from a long way back, admittedly, but the, the rate of development of this cluster is not to be taken lightly. It's probably worth saying that this, uh, I don't know if you can read the, uh, the print there, but that, that is a SAP cluster with um, uh, platinum Xeons and, uh, and seven NVMe devices in each, in each server. So, so it's not a cheap undertaking either. Um, a lot of this, uh, this benchmark, this is published by Intel, and so a lot of the uh, performance on here is because it's an exemplar demonstrator of the very latest Intel processors and storage components. 
The machine that we are using logically looks a little bit like this. So we've got 60 nice landing nodes, got an omnipath fabric in the middle, uh, it's got three switches, it's not quite big enough for a factory network or anything, but it's, it, it, it works. And, uh, and then on the other side we have login nodes, visualization nodes, and the data storage nodes where our NVMe devices are located. Within the storage nodes themselves, um, I mean, this is fairly familiar to um, uh, some of the diagrams we were seeing earlier, uh, two sockets, they're broad rails eons, so they're a generation behind. Uh, we have a um, NVMe device located on each socket, and we've got um, 128 gigs of RAM and 100 gig fabric. The, um, the SSDs in this machine, the P3600s, are quite old. So they're two generations old, and in NVMe terms, that is quite old. Uh, they still deliver, but um, the right performance on new technologies is far more solid, and um, we'll see a bit of that soon. So, Ceph is organized very much in a similar sort of pattern to conventional high-performance computing uh, parallel file systems. You have object storage demons, you have monitor demons, you have metadata servers. All of these concepts are pretty familiar. Uh, this is a fairly standard sort of pattern. Um, the difference being that object storage demons are storing objects rather than storage files and, and so on. So, so it is an object storage platform first and foremost. The, one of the innovations that Ceph has introduced is this thing it calls Crush, which is this process in which clients can work out which node to, to speak to in a cluster in order to retrieve the data. So there is a single communication directly between the Ceph client and one of the object storage servers, and there is no relaying through a metadata server or any other such thing in order to retrieve data. And this is the thing that underpins the scalability of Ceph in terms of the number of clients, the number of storage servers, the whole thing works very well indeed. So one of the, um, this is a kind of a loose representation of the way that we organized the, um, the server nodes. So we have um, two NVMe devices in each one, represented by the line of blocks. Each of those we split into four partitions. So we could actually spread out the IOPS of the single device across four um, OSD processes uh, within each of, the, uh, each of the servers, and then four from the other node, and we could start to build up a, um, a nice sort of balance between the NVMe capacity and, and the IOPS, the CPU capacity and IOPS, and the network as well. And we were looking to strike a sort of a sweet spot where each of them was maxed out to, to, a, to an equal level. So the, um, having four uh, storage demons per MPV device is the green line on this chart, and, uh, and also the graph. So this is a study by Intel, uh, which I came along, up, came along after we'd made that call, and it shows that it's still a pretty good decision Two, NV, two um, storage demons per NVMe also looks pretty good. Four seems to be good for, um, for most cases, but it uses a bit more CPU. But it turns out the CPU is what we have plenty of. I find it a bit odd that there was no data for three, actually. It's just, just one of those things that computer scientists are always thinking powers of two. Strange. So, if we're doing a performance analysis, we do need to build up from solid foundations. And the methodology that we chose was to look at each of the individual components and their raw capabilities before we start to look at the system as a whole. So we try and start off with as small a piece of testing as we can, measure the performance, incorporate other pieces, and see where the fat gets introduced in terms of overhead. So the obvious place to start is to look at the disks and see what kind of performance we get when we're running locally on a node using benchmarks like FIA. And we get about 5.2 gigabytes a second, reading off all eight partitions on the disks uh, simultaneously. So that's our baseline. We get 20.8 gigabytes a second from all four nodes. That is the sum total of everything that can be achieved uh, by this storage cluster. <coughs> now we can start to add some more layers and understand where the, um, where the problems might be. 
So this is the first problem, is the OmniPath network. We are not using OmniPath on native transports. The RDNA protocols, the IP verbs, we're using IP over InfiniBand on the OmniPath based fabric interfaces. And this diagram here is showing a kind of a Sankey diagram of the level of performance that we get. And the first thing we see is that it's quite low. The best we do is about 50 gigabits a second on 100 gigabits. The other thing that happens is we get huge variation, which doesn't really make sense in, um, in this between the sort of the maximum test speed and the minimum speed when we run our tests. So we could get a factor of two, 25 gigabits to 50 gigabits a second. Didn't really figure out why. It's nothing to do with core placements, IRQ placements, or anything else placements, as far as I can see. Now, the other interesting thing was that the nice landing chips were doing far, far worse than anything else. <coughs> Um, that's simply because of the architecture. We're running a, sing a sequential test here. So we're really um, hitting them where at that weakest point there. So when we compare network performance and, um, and disk performance, and we put them side by side, we get this kind of weird graph where the night's landing network is, is a fraction of the capabilities of the disks that we have. And the, the Xeons are on a par, but the variation between good Xeon network bandwidth and bad Xeon network bandwidth is so huge uh, that it was causing us a good deal of uncertainty um, when we were doing our testing. So we started this um, investigation in uh, August last year when it was still uh, set dual release. And um, one of the early things that we did was when the Luminous release came out, we updated to that. And we changed also the way that Seth was talking and managing his storage on the object storage demons from uh, the conventional method based on um, um, XFS or file store to a new sort of block database method called Blue Store. And this, is, this is one of the big, big innovations in the Seth world was this migration to a different um, all of the deployment was managed with Seth Ansible, so everything was automated and repeated, which meant that we repeated it a lot, and um, we did actually uh, do some interesting experiments to do with varying the parameters, redeploying, and Ansible is a good way of taking care of that. It's best not to linger on this graph too much, because this is, this is the worst graph of the, um, the day, so don't take any photos of this one. Um, but what we were seeing was, um, when we first started out, we were getting about 500 megabytes a second of write bandwidth on our cluster that's capable of 12 gigabytes a second, and, um, and about a gigabyte a second of read bandwidth on a cluster that's capable of about 20.8. So this is, this is pretty poor. And when we upgraded to Luminous, little pieces helped. I mean, in, for the smaller objects, it's obviously a little bit better at handling higher concurrency or higher IOPS on the small objects. And for me, examples, but the headline levels were pretty terrible. So the first thing we decided to do was we needed to move on to the new storage technology, this thing, Blue Store. And Blue Store is optimized for hard drives, so that we're using all flash, so it's all NVMe. So we weren't sure that we would see much benefit. But one of the things that was being claimed was that the number of bytes for every byte of protocol is dramatically reduced. So we should be able to see when we get starting to get towards the limitations of the device in terms of saturation, we should see a good improvement. The first thing to do then was to look at the bytes of protocol, which is uh, the, the RADOS data transfer, which is this bottom line. Uh, this is over time, so this is a two minute run. And we're getting about a gigabyte a second or so is what we were seeing. This is right. When we look at what the raw devices are doing for the same axis, we can see they're doing far more work than the actual bytes of protocol that are being carried. So this is the inherent crackiness of the, the original storage backend. Partly what we're doing is we're replicating. So in every byte here is going to be double because it gets stored in two places. But we also write it to a journal and then to the eventual file store backend. So we double again. And then, 
We also do a little bit of extra writing for managing the file system state, the I nodes and the D entries and the other pieces. So we get another half or so. So we're getting about four and a half bytes written for every byte of protocol born. And that's part of the reason why, if you were looking at set this time last year, it would be a very sad story. It would be really quite lame in terms of the performance. So we moved to the new um, BlueStore backend, and the first thing it does is it can economize, it can avoid the write to a journal device and then to the final device by writing directly into the block. And the other thing it does is it's actually a whole lot faster as well. So what we're seeing here is a graph where the physical device saturation is slightly above the 10 gigabytes a second at the top, and we are now getting to within 80% of the physical capabilities of the device implementing a, um, a sort of a 2x write amplification factor. So what we see now is we have reduced it right down to only the bytes that have to be written. If we're doing two-way replication, we have to write two copies, end of story. And we are writing two bytes for every byte of storage here. So this is, this is a pretty good job. And I think this, this looks really strong for the way that um, Seth is going. What would be nice would have been to look at some of the more economical methods of writing. So erasure coding, if we had more storage demons, we could have implemented erasure coding. With a format cluster, it's a little bit small for doing that, so we weren't able to do that with this one. But I think this, uh, this graph alone reaffirms progress that Seth has made in When we look at the performance over different object sizes, we can see this other interesting feature, which is um, so we've got the original file store backend, which is the blue line, and the blue store one is the new performance for different object sizes um, using blue store. But this kind of grouping off, this, this thing that's uh, sort of tailing down here, that is because Seth does not, uh, at the low level, at the radios level, it doesn't strike your objects. So, there, there is some sort of an inherent um, sort of syndrome, behavior, that's going on, where once we get above a certain size, with a high degree of concurrency, we either fall out of the working set, or we fall out of the cache, or something happens, to the point where we get this sort of group of performance. So, the other lesson from today is, we need to, if you're looking at set, when you're interacting with it at a low object level API, um, either use the Radar Striper library, so then you can actually uh, stripe it somewhere between, say, there and there, or um, control the size of the objects by some other means so that you don't actually go over. This is about, uh, sort of goes, starts to go bad around about um, uh, two or four megabytes, so not big. Really, no. <coughs> Um, so now we're doing some benchmarking, we're having some fun, so the other thing that I did is I turned off all the authentication and, um, and some other pieces and went with uh, um, one-way replication and that gives you this nice orange line above there, so now we're, um, we're doing pretty well um, just by getting some cheap tricks which you might only use in a benchmarking situation. There was um, something that we noticed along the way with our devices, which is probably something which, uh, for anyone who is looking after NVMe devices here, probably is also seen, was uh, this slightly um, um, undesirable feature of the NVMe devices that we were using, where if we ran them for a long time, we're doing a sustained level of writes, the performance would suddenly do this. So we go from nice high level of performance, around about five gigabytes a second mark, down to about half of that and it would be sustained. And these red spikes, the impulses here, are commit latencies. So what we can see is that sometimes the NVMe devices just hold, they just pause. And presumably what's going on inside the NVMe device is it's doing a bit of reshuffling and it's finding some blocks and some other pieces uh, because we've used up <coughs> and it has collected already as, um, as previous devices. So, Apparently, the, uh, the new version of SAF, which came out three weeks ago, the, M the Mimic release, does also include block discards as part of its capability. I'm going to look at this again 
um, when we have that deployed on the cluster to see whether it has actually made any material difference uh, to these kinds of um, uh, behaviors. Intel's graphs uh, kind of show the same thing. So this is another Intel performance uh, result um, comparing Octane with the previous generation. So this is the 3700. We're looking at write commits, or we're looking at bandwidth here, in fact, and these are write commit devices, um, later season. And we have the previous generation to this. So we see that when, we, when we're sustained, we're crashing the device in a sustained way, we do get these irregular, uh, very undesirable um, artifacts in the way that it's performing. And if you buy the Octane device, which is on the left, you can see that the numbers are pretty similar. You don't get a big uptake in bandwidth. But what you do get is rock solid stability in the uh, in the pipe behavior. And that actually is probably worth paying for. The machine that we were using has um, four Xeon visualization nodes, of which I had access to two at the time. So this is not really the best scaling. I could go from one node to two nodes. Brilliant. Um, but I did have access to 20 nice landing servers, and what we can see is that they they go from one client to three, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty. I think we start to get up to around about 16 gigabytes a second on reads when we're using a high, highly concurrent fan out of clients, and we start to get towards uh, five gigabytes a second on writes, which is reasonably close, although not brilliant compared to the limitations of the machine. So <coughs> the next experiment that I did was with my 20 clients, I then turned off all of the process of power sipping stuff in the service, um, disabling the seat states, and this black line on the top is 20 clients being served by the same service but with all the power saving turned off. So we were talking earlier about the advantages of power economy. Uh, this is the advantage of power diseconomy, or whatever it is, that, whatever the opposite of economy is. Um, when we run our four servers with no sleep states and none of this other stuff, we get a good uptick. And now, if you look at this performance here, north of 16 gigabytes a second, on a machine which is has a raw capability of just over 20, we're getting about 75% of the raw read capability of the devices aggregated across our four storage nodes. 75% after the set protocol overhead and after you, you know, having the remoteness of initiating from the client and fetching the data, that's pretty good. And that's the kind of numbers that you would only otherwise see in luster file systems or <coughs> those kinds of things. So these numbers, so admittedly this sort of scaling out is, is Seth's strongest point. This is Seth's party trip, is that it does scale. But I was surprised at just how good it could get close to the theoretical raw limits of the performance of the hardware. On the right, it's actually even better. We're getting pretty much saturated by the performance there. So we couldn't write any faster than that. What we could do is write that speed with fewer clients. Um, and that's probably where the next level of investigation is coming from. So we have an Omnipath machine here. And we're using the network in this terrible way of IP over InfiniBand uh, networking. The kind of something that's been <coughs> waiting in the wings for a long time in the Ceph world has been this idea of, well, let's not use TCP IP for the messages between the servers and between the clients. What about if we use RDNA itself? So we have this nice fabric, and we can then just flip over and send all our messages either between the storage demons for the replication traffic or between the storage demons and the clients themselves um, into either Omnipath or InfiniBand or Rocky, which is our domain of Ethernet. So I, I was in a lucky situation where I had access to three machines equipped with these three network fabrics. So I tried out the um, RDMA features that are available in the most recent versions of SAF. And it didn't quite work on Omnipath, and it didn't quite work on InfiniBand, but it did work on Rocky. And so, but if you want to try this yourselves, um, configuration is surprisingly, and then suddenly your set cluster is talking on
the CentOS SAP um, RPMs that I was using, they have it built in. So you don't have to think about it too much in order to start experimenting with this. The only problem is that in two out of three cases it didn't work. So the Rocky machine is um, a little de detour that's not one of the human brain project systems. Uh, we're actually going to have a look here at the um, hardware prototyping platform for the SKA radio telescope, uh, which we've been using. This is an open stack system, it's bare metal, and it's equipped with the um, 25 gig Ethernet, uh, which is actually the blue so. so, there was a slight problem though. Um, when we tested against TCP, we see almost no difference. The only real difference is around about this short object thing, there's a very steep curve, and we get a few percent, like five or ten percent benefit. This is not right. So the RDMA implementation in Luminous was not delivering what we wanted here. But it's pretty clear that what's going on with this system <coughs> is it is entirely limited by the bandwidth of the storage and uh, this flat line here, the bandwidth of the network. So it probably will we're looking at RDMA doing the right things, but we're not looking at the right ways of exposing any advantage here. And the first thing to look at, and I'm afraid I don't have the graphs for this, don't, don't get your hopes up, uh, is to take away the storage backends and use something like MemStore, so then we can just serve RDMA data out of memory map set file systems. These are, these are investigations that are going on, so, uh, and uh, the other thing to say is that RDMA is a moving target in the set world. So what we see today is being actively developed by at least two companies. So uh, the, the port I was using was by a Chinese company called NextSky. Uh, and Intel and Nanolox are both developing alternative RDMA implementations. So Seth's getting there pretty quick. Uh, if you look at the speed of development there, it makes a strong case that if you're not looking at it this re release, we should be looking at it next release. For the kind of flexible workflows where we're talking about mixing together software-defined technologies with HPC to make better advantages for the users and the <coughs> people running on our systems. Um, but it's probably not the only way that we could be approaching this, and I was just going to quickly talk about that positive <coughs> problem again. Because there's other ways that we can apply software-defined infrastructure, like SAF, to conventional HPC systems, like the um, HPC, so like the Sloan kind of um, workload, workload model. What we want to do here is look at a different way of innovating in storage, which is this project which is going on with um, uh, one of my colleagues at, at uh, Cambridge University. So this is the Cambridge Data Accelerator which is a form of software-defined burst buffer. When we look at this idea, again, we're creating file systems and storage tiers, object caches and other things, according to a workflow's requirements. And um, we're using it in this uh, sort of tier one HPC facility in the UK. So Cambridge owns and operates the largest computer in research computing in the United Kingdom. This is uh, 1.7 petaflops. What they're doing is they have a number of these uh, data accelerator nodes in the, uh, between the sort of production luster file store and the, the various compute node resources. Uh, these nodes are well equipped. They've got the P4600 NVMEs, so they are very close to the best you can get. Uh, it's got 12 of them in each compute node and 200 gig on path mix in each compute node as well. These nodes are benchmarked as being able to saturate both 100 gig on path nodes from both or from all 12 of the um, NVMEs as a file system. So, what this does for the POSIX problem is that it prevents, it confines the scaling issues that POSIX is facing by creating a small file system isolated and confined to your job. In order for you to use it as scratch space, you can have your data staged into it as part of the scheduling for the job and staged out at the end back into the Lustre production file system, which is serving the billions of items for everyone else in the cluster. So this works provided you aren't the only user of the cluster, in which case it's just a fast cache. 
So first buffers are this evolving concept, and um, I should probably skip this because I think we're a little bit on time. But the, uh, the interesting piece here is how uh, the team at Cambridge and, and our guys have gone about making first buffers work here. So what we've done is we've taken the existing Slurm plugin for data warp, and when you look, they do a cursory examination of how it's been implemented, actually it's a bunch of sub-process commands around create and one line tools. So what we did was we re-implemented those command line tools with the same parameters for the same semantics around some Python scripts which talk to Go, which talk to um, the, the sort of a distributed database based on etcetrity. And the whole thing creates the effect of data warp in the same semantics as the uh, data warp use cases uh, of the Slurm plugin, but using this sort of um, custom assembled um, first part of hardware. The Cambridge Data Accelerator is open source and will be published and will be shared and, and hopefully uh, uh, shared widely. So software-defined storage in various ways is going to help tackle this problem of scaling large POSIX file systems. There's nothing quite as good as object storage in terms of scalability, but object storage is a bit of a pain in the backside in terms of you have to change the application because so many people assume a file system they are. CephFS, I haven't really talked about that because the Human Brain Project is exclusively on objects. It's going to get there. I'm curious as to which, which approach will win. And thank you very much. Thank you.